There is no worse feeling than seeing a beloved houseplant wither away in front of your eyes, especially when it's because of a disease that you don't know how to identify, treat, or understand. For some reason, plant diseases feel trickier than pest or environmental issues when it comes to plants failing because it's what's happening within the plant, inside of the plant. It's something that we can't see, we can't feel it, we can't physically remove it like we could with a pest, right? We can't just change the lighting environment. We've got to figure out what's going on under the hood. But plant diseases are surprisingly treatable if you have the savvy to identify the disease before it's too late. And if you already have the materials on hand to treat it quickly, that's what this episode is all about, empowering you to be ready to go when a plant inevitably gets a disease and needs treatment. And of course, we are joined again by our beloved horticulturist, Leslie Halleck, for another installment of the Grow Better series, which is all about Leslie and me teaming up to make episodes to help you grow better houseplants rooted in a scientific understanding of what is happening beyond a basic care card or blog. So let's dive in. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hello, plant friends. Welcome. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. I have to say, I am having like a massive bird bomb moment. I was recording the intro to this podcast and I had to stop because my baby budgie Frankie, you might hear him right now. He just flew out of his cage and sat on my microphone. (laughs) And now he's tweeting up a storm because I think he's annoyed that I'm paying more attention to my computer than him. (laughs) But like what an epic bird mom moment. I've been working so hard to train him to get comfortable to like hop around my office and fly around my office. And that was like a total, total moment. So anyway, I had to share that with you. I love being a bird mom. I love being a bird mom so much. But anyway, this is a podcast about plants. I digress. Welcome plant friends. If you are new here, hello, I'm Maria, your host. It is my goal to help you grow plants successfully indoors and outdoors and cultivate joy in your life through doing so. I think plant care is incredible self-care and I think the act of caring for plants makes, breeds kind people and the world needs more kind people right now. And if you're a repeat listener, welcome back. You know that already. Thank you. Thanks for coming back to the show. Thanks for returning over and over and over again to be on this plant journey with me. I'm so honored to be a part of your plant parent journey and your plant parent empowerment. That's a lot of peas. I'm in a good mood today because I'm bringing you this episode with one of my best plant friends, Leslie Halleck. She's a horticulturist extraordinaire epic plant nerd. She's been joining us for this Grow Better series where we're trying to tackle topics that really require a horticulturist scientific understanding. So we want to bring you these episodes that really help you understand the science, the physics, the we're going under the hood. We're going deep in these episodes to really get a better fundamental understanding on plants in general and plant science in general to be able to take that and move into the world and use that knowledge for all of our plants, right? And plant disease. Talk about something confusing, right? We're really diving deep in that. And I love that I get to make this series, this mini series with my friend, Leslie, because she's my dear, dear friend. I love her so much. And speaking of plant friends, I wanted to give a shout out to three plant friends, the newest members of the Growing Joy Garden Society, Ali F, Ting X, and Nicole O. Nicole is actually a old college friend of mine who has recently gotten into plants and joined the Garden Society. So Ali Ting and Nicole, welcome to the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. And if you don't know what the Growing Joy Garden Society is, it's my private, troll-free, algorithm-free platform, iOS and Android app. You can access it via computer or app on your phone. And I created it to bring our international community together to make new plant friends, propagate your knowledge, and grow more joy in your life. I call it the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet because that's exactly what it is. We have free classes and courses for you. I've got a plant killer to plant person crash course. I've got a plant parent personality course in there. It's all available to you with a monthly subscription that costs about the cost of a fancy coffee. 
And we closed our Patreon down. So if you're a you know, believer in the show and you want to support the show, joining the Garden Society is the way to do that. The subscriptions, the memberships to the Garden Society helps me support all of the amazing plant people that work on the show, like our editor and our podcast manager and our designer. So thanks in advance for supporting the show. And I can't wait to get to know you better there. If you want to join us, you can go to jointhegardensociety.com and message me and say hello when you've joined. All right, back to my dear friend, Leslie Halleck. It's time to party. This is a big one. This is a big interview. Lots of talk about disease. So let's dive right in. Leslie, my friend, welcome back. Again, here I am. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm so happy to have you help us grow better. The Grow Better mini series with Leslie Halleck. I love this name for the mini series that we came up with. Well, you know, there's so much to learn when it comes to plants and gardening. And I think that, you know, ultimately as a hobbyist or a professional, that's the goal, right? It's just to grow better. It takes time and a lot of hands-on experience to become a really skilled grower. So it's a process of learning that you have to build on. So what better name for it than grow better? I love it. Grow better, feel better, be better. Those are all the feelings that we're trying to instigate with this series. And, you know, I'm so lucky that I have that we as a community have you as our plant nerd friend (laughs) to dive into the nitty gritty of the stuff that you really need to call the big guns in for. It's not just how to grow Hoya. It's, oh, my God, my plant has mosaic virus and I don't know what to do. Oh, my gosh, my plant's life is at stake And we've got it. There's not a lot of room for error here. So plant disease. Let's just dive right in because this is a big topic and you have so much information in your brain that I want to mill, I guess. The first episode we did, we talked about more environmental factors. The second episode we did, we talked about pests, disease. What is plant disease? Why do our plants get sick? Well, it's interesting. So let's talk about the word disease, because speaking as a scientist, when you say the word disease, essentially what you're talking about is any entity or process, living or non-living, so biotic or abiotic, that's interfering with your plant's normal functions over a period of time. So disease is not restricted to simply something like a bacteria, disease can also mean a non-infectious physical injury or stress caused by light or temperature or air pollution, right? All of those things also cause dis-ease in a plant. So terminology-wise, when we're talking about diseases, they can be living contagious pathogens or they can be things like environmental issues. So environmental stresses still contribute to disease in a plant. So ultimately, when we say, what is a disease? It's basically anything that's interrupting your plant's natural viability and ability to thrive. Okay. So technically, the other episodes we've been talking about fall under almost the umbrella of disease? Correct. So yeah, disease can be a nutritional deficiency. It can be a pathogen. It can be all sorts of things like that. But today, we're going to focus on biotic diseases, right? The things that people think of as diseases, pathogens, right? That attack and can be contagious to your plants, right? Right. Pathogens. Okay. So things like fungal diseases, viruses, bacteria, nematodes. Okay. These are all things that would fall into the biotic disease, infectious pathogen categories. When you just said fungal disease, viral, I was like, yeah, like what humans can get. And then you said nematodes. And I was like, wait, no, (laughs) not what humans can get. Well, okay, I hate to tell you, but those are little roundworms and humans can get plenty of worms. (laughs) So it really is. They affect plants just like what we think of diseases in humans, right? So you basically all of those things fall under the biotic or living entity disease category. So fungi or or fungal like organisms, we call them FLOs. So if you want a fun, <laughs> if you want a fun acronym, you know, viruses, you, you've heard of, of things like mosaic virus, bacteria that are microscopic, single celled organisms. And there's even parasitic plants, right, as well, that can kind of fall under that biotic disease category. Nematodes, 
you know, little round worms. Not something that we deal with as much in the houseplant world, but there are susceptible houseplants. Okay, so why do plants get these diseases? Yeah, so there are a few different reasons why a plant that you may have in your collection could get a disease. And we call this in biology uh, the disease triangle. So you need to have three factors present. You need to have your host plant. There have to be environmental conditions at play. And then there has to be a pathogen, right? That has to obviously exist in order for your plant to get infected. So your plant has to first come in contact or the pathogen needs to come in contact with a host, right? Because it needs that host in order to feed itself. It then has to gain entry into your plant. So that can happen through things like wounds, you know, physical damage. So you could have a plant that is, you know, has a a leaf knocked off of it or broken because you brushed up against it. That creates an open wound. Fungal diseases have the ability to actually puncture and penetrate plant tissue. Bacteria can enter through something like a wound or stomata. So that's kind of the next step. And then it has to establish itself and grow and reproduce. So if you've got a susceptible host, you've got environmental conditions that are conducive for that pathogen to inoculate that plant, and you have the presence of a pathogen, that's why your plants get a disease. And plants that are particularly stressed, maybe that are already suffering from, say, a light deficiency or a nutrient deficiency, are more susceptible, right? So that environment being out of balance for that plant causes stress in the host plant, makes it even more susceptible to any form of disease. So that's just the basic the basic ingredients required for why your plant would become infected with a disease. I love that triangle. That makes me like, I felt like as you were speaking, I could just see the triangle, like a little infographic. That's great. We've got to put that together for yeah. for the show notes. Okay, so we've got those three factors. Those three factors happen. A pathogen meets the host. How does this present? We're going to talk about how to identify, right? Yeah. This is I think, where most people get stopped in terms of, okay, what do I do now? How do I identify? And As we've talked about before, this can be tricky because many diseases look very similar to one another, even if they are abiotic or biotic. So for example, fluoride toxicity, like let's talk about Dracaena, fluoride toxicity, those are Dracaena are particularly sensitive to fluoride in water, but that toxicity damage, the necrosis of tissue can look very similar to fusarium leaf spot on Dracaena, right? Many different diseases will present very similar symptoms, okay? So developing really good observational skill is key. However, I'm going to tell you that symptomology alone is pretty unreliable, especially if you are not a plant scientist, horticultural plant pathologist, right, that has spent a very long time doing this or has access to a microscope or can culture it. So first, I want to give you a couple of important definitions, signs and symptoms. These are not the same thing. Unfortunately, these two terms get used interchangeably a lot. So I'm going to break it down really simply for you. A sign of a disease is the disease, evidence of the disease itself, the pathogen. You can actually see the microorganism or the, let's say spores of a fungus or the hyphae or mycelium or like ooze that's coming from bacteria, you can actually see, maybe under a microscope, evidence of the actual pathogen itself. Sometimes that identification can only be done with a microscope. Others actually have to be cultured in a lab to be able to identify the actual species. Clearly, Most home plant parents aren't going to have access to that sort of equipment, right? But say if it's a fungal disease, you may actually, especially with your handy little magnifying glass, be able to see spores. If you see spores on your plant, what you are actually seeing is a sign of the disease. So how is that different from a symptom? A symptom is actually the reaction of the plant. And these are the things that you are mostly seeing visually, okay, is the reaction to the disease. So these are visual alterations in a sick plant, right? And I can kind of run through the basic things, the symptoms that you are most commonly going to see if you want to do that. We can run through that list, yeah. So very obviously, tissue color changes, right? 
leaf yellowing, stems yellowing, spots, chlorosis, a pattern that could be from a virus. That could also be light stress or nutritional, right? So yellowing can be from light stress. Yellowing could be from a nutritional deficiency, or it could be from a pathogen like a fungal disease or a virus. Are you ready to uplevel your houseplant game, my friend? On this Grow Better series with Leslie, we have talked about the importance of light. And if you do not have enough light, if you are worried that you don't have enough light, Soltech and their grow lights are the answer to your prayers. And our friends at Soltech have recently dropped something so cool, their brand new Grove LED bar light. A bar light, the answer to our prayer. The Grove is Soltech's latest tool to sprinkle your home with nature in a grow bar for your plants that makes illuminating your hard-to-light kitchen cabinets, bookshelves, Ikea grow houses, and more. What's so magical about the Grove, you ask, Maria? Well, flexibility. Whether you need light under your shelves, on your walls, in your mini herb garden, in your bookshelf, the Grove has got your back. It shines a full-spectrum glow, giving your green buddies exactly the light they need, And it comes with warm, natural color temperature. And it comes with the same warm, natural color temperature that all Soltech products have. It literally will just look like any other type of light that you have in your home. And like its Soltech siblings, the Aspect Pendant Light and the Vita Grow Bulb, you get a 90-day money-back guarantee and free shipping in the U.S. Plus a five-year warranty. Like five years free shipping and a 90-day money-back guarantee. Why not try it, right? And The Grove is available for $130, but you get a 15% discount as a member of our Growing Joy tribe with code BLOOM15 at checkout. And this is a new product. They're flying off the shelves, so snag one quickly. You head to soltech.com, S-O-L-T-E-C.com, and use the code BLOOM15 at checkout for a 15% discount. Imagine that beautiful harmony wafting its way through your home or porch while you sit cozily bundled up enjoying the fall foliage with your favorite warm drink. Or better yet, gifting the glorious experience of a Wind River chime to a loved one so every time they hear it, they think of you. Plus, if the fall aesthetic attracts you, Wind River Chimes come in a variety of deliciously rich fall colors. I personally have their deep purple and their deep green, and they look so beautiful on my balconies. As the school year picks up and summer fades away, a Wind River Wind Chime can be the antidote to your back-to-school stress. Although the frenetic energy of the season can feel like it combats nature, which is slowing down and preparing to rest, your Wind River Wind Chimes will bring you back to yourself with their soothing, harmonious songs. Today, Wind River is choosing to use their ad time to gift you a mindful moment with their chimes. So enjoy. Treat yourself or someone you love to these glorious sounds by gifting a Wind River wind chime, which you can personalize. Gift them the mindfulness that comes along with these wind chimes, plant friends. To personalize it for free, you can use code GROWINGJOY at checkout at windriverchimes.com. That coupon code will get you a free engraving on any of the engravable wind chimes on their website. They come in a variety of colors, a variety of sizes, and a variety of sounds. You can actually mix and match chimes to go together, or you can have them individually like I do. So head to windriverchimes.com, listen and learn, and don't forget to use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to receive your free engraving. Necrotic tissue. That's another thing to look. Dead tissue, dead spots, decay, damping off. If we're talking about seedlings, you know, they just kind of like mush and rot. That's a symptom. Wilting, right? Wilting, classic symptom that could be water, temperature, humidity, stress, right? That we've talked about in a previous episode. Or it could be because of a fungal disease. Verticillium wilt. Fusarium, these are fungal diseases that actually colonize in the xylem, the vascular tissue of the plant. And that's why it stops water transport. That's how a fungal disease like that actually causes a plant to wilt, is that it blocks water transport by growing in the xylem. Okay. Leaf drop, losing leaves. Okay. That could also be water stress, but it could be because of a pathogen. 
deformed tissues, right? Uh, leaf curling or swelling, galls and twisting, that can be a result of pathogens. Stunting, okay? So the plant just stunts. Everything gets small and basically stops growing. That, that can be a result of viruses. Deformed tissue and stunting are often associated with viruses. So those are sort of your classic symptoms that most of you are probably going to see, right, on your plant first. And then we have to figure out, is this a mechanical plant care issue or is this an actual pathogen? We get to diagnosis, right? Yeah, it's tricky because so many of these symptoms can actually be so many things. I mean, we talked about that in the overwatering, underwatering episode, but um, it's really tricky for like a novice plant parent to really understand what's going on underneath the surface without having a lab that you can do tests right. with. Yeah. So, you know, I usually will get asked, okay, well, if symptomology is unreliable, unless you are an expert, and even if you are an expert, I tell people, I don't have a microscope sitting in front of me, so I may not be able to tell you exactly what species that you're dealing with. I can ballpark it for you. And if you've taken one of my classes, like you have, or and some of your listeners have, you know that what I tell you I'm doing is teaching you observational skills, right? And honing your observational skills means taking your environment into account. So the first thing, if you're worried your plant has a disease, right? So let's walk through kind of a scenario. Your plant is not thriving and you suspect that there is a disease. I'm always going to say prevention is the best treatment, right? The more you can prevent through good care, but you need to take your environment into consideration. Like, okay, I'm seeing uh, yellowing foliage. Um, my light's good. My watering's good. Oh, but maybe I now have little round spots or circles developing. That could help you determine whether you're dealing with a pathogen, right? Or an abiotic mechanical issue like plant care. So, you know, biosecurity is something that I talk about a lot. Checking all of your plants regularly, the sooner you catch something and can prevent it, the better. So always scouting your plants, looking for issues, and then taking your environment into consideration. Like, for example, if you have spots developing on leaves, if your plant is growing in an indoor greenhouse or in a greenhouse and there's high humidity, well, then it's likely that that could potentially be a fungal disease versus just a watering issue, right? If the air is very dry and that particular disease needs high humidity or water on the foliage to be able to move, then perhaps that is a care issue or a watering issue. So you Always taking your environment into account is key. Keeping your little magnifying glass is handy because you can take a closer look very quickly. You might be able to see spores in that little black spot that's on your leaf. And if you see little bumps there that look like spores, then chances are you know you're dealing with a fungal disease, right? Versus, you know, a nutritional deficiency. And we can kind of walk through when we get to walking through some of the diseases, we can talk about sort of basic things to look for between each one of these categories. But sometimes the best way to prevent, you know, is culling the herd, right? Sometimes it's pulling that plant out of your collection completely. So the first thing that you should do is think about biosecurity and think about segregating that plant and quarantining it away from the rest of your plants so that you can then go through the process of trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, so when I first see that my plant isn't doing it well, whether it's mold on the leaves, whether it's dropping leaves, all the symptoms that you mentioned, which could be a myriad of things, I think the first step is going to be, like you just said, isolating it and then going deeper into becoming the super sleuth that we all are to figure this out. So are there general ways to eradicate disease or you really need to know what the disease is before? you start treating? Yeah, you have to know what you're dealing with, clearly, because if you decide to use a treatment for a fungal disease and what you actually have as a bacterial disease, well, that's not going to do any good. If you have a virus, you know, nothing that you treat is going to do any good. So understanding symptomology is problematic. Understanding you don't have a microscope or a way to potentially culture these diseases. Let me give you some really general guidelines Yeah, that, again, are not specific, but this is sort of basic guidelines I give my students. Okay. 
fungal diseases. Fungal diseases often present in things like root rot, stem lesions, right? So icky spots developing on your stems, lots of leaf spot diseases, often with concentric circles or little yellow halos around them, oftentimes can signify a fungal disease. You may see little spores, right? Or other growths in those spots. That's going to tell you it's probably fungal. You might see also mycelia. You might start to see, right, those little white looking threads that develop with fungal diseases. Okay. That would be a sign of a fungal disease, right? And then the yellowing or discoloring tissue around it would be the symptom, right? Mm -hmm. um, Viruses are often going to produce a mosaic type discoloration pattern? Yes, mosaic virus is famous in the houseplant community because a lot of people see mosaic virus and they think variation, but actually the plant is very sick. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Mosaic viruses in particular create patterns that can be quite pretty and you think they're variation like, oh, I just scored this sweet variegated sport that I'm going to propagate and what you may not realize is what you actually have is a mosaic virus And propagating that and giving it away would be the worst thing that you could do because you would be spreading a non-curable virus, okay? So viruses can also, again, cause that leaf stem distortion or stunting. You know, we don't, can't cure viruses and a number of viruses, you know, are terminal, right? Eventually, you know, it's just going to kill that plant. And the best thing for you to do is obviously get rid of that plant. Bacterial diseases, Again, very generally, because a lot of the symptoms can cross over, but you often will see angular type lesions on the leaves that are bordered by leaf veins. So angular lesions that present between the leaf veins can also be surrounded by chlorotic halos or water soaked, like mushy turning to black water soaked areas. A lot of times bacterial diseases will start at the edge of the leaf and move in versus like random spots that just show up and then start to spread into the main tissue. That said, some bacterial diseases can have a dry quirky appearance. And understand all of these diseases can present differently on different species of houseplants. That's what makes it trickier. But those are some very general symptomology guidelines that I give folks. And then you say, okay, I think this is a bacteria. And you look at your environment and say, is the air very humid? Have I been spritzing water on the leaves? Have I been leaving water sitting on the leaves? That can be a problem for both bacterial and fungal diseases. And then you dig down a little bit deeper and you say, okay, what species am I growing? Let's say I'm growing an orchid. Okay, well, general things to know about orchids is that they tend to be very susceptible to leaf fungal and bacterial diseases, especially if there's water on the foliage. So if you do the math and you add all of those things up, you can say, okay, I'm pretty confident I have this bacterial disease, or I'm pretty confident I have a fungal disease. Then you can start digging around and looking to see if you can find images that sort of correlate with what you're seeing. And then you decide on a treatment plan. After you feel like you've gotten as close as you can to figuring what you have. Because again, using a fungicide on a virus is not going to do any good. It's like taking antibiotics for a cold or COVID or anything like that, you know, obviously isn't going to help you. Can we go back for a minute? Because you brought something up that I think is a huge piece of misinformation in the houseplant community that I think causes people so much more harm than good, which is that bacterial and fungal diseases, infections can often come from water sitting on the leaves. And so many people misunderstand the spritzers for these houseplants. Everybody gets a spritzer. And if you're spritzing the air around your houseplant and the water is going into the air, fine, whatever. But when you're spritzing the, and I'm only speaking from my personal experience, I used to do this with my plants, when you spray the, you're pretty, you know, you get your really cute crystal spritzer, your metal spritzer. They've got all sorts of like the quick release ones now. And then you spritz your plant and that water sits on your leaves. And if it doesn't evaporate fast enough, that water is creating the environment for bacterial and fungal diseases to set in. So I think a lot of beginner houseplant parents that don't necessarily understand that end up setting their plants up for failure when they're spritzing, thinking that they're increasing the humidity because houseplants like humidity, which totally in earnest, like it makes total sense when that's what you're told. But 
it actually can be quite problematic. Yeah. And every stock photo that you see, it's so funny. Every stock photo that's out there, you know, that people are using for brands or social media, it's like if you search by houseplant, almost so many of the photos come up with people misting plants. Yes. And totally. misting ridiculous things like cactus and things that normally, you know, I mean, come on, that you're not going to miss, but it is a great misconception Misting the air around your plants with a little mister does relatively nothing to raise humidity around your plants. So it's relatively ineffective. Now, you could treat it as a placebo effect. You know, you're doing something. It's not going to hurt it as long as that moisture does not build up and sit on the leaves. Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. most people are misting directly on the plant foliage. If you are not growing aquatic or semi-aquatic species, right, in like a riparium or something like that, and you are misting water, you're growing orchids, and you're just misting water directly on that foliage, many of those diseases have things called zoospores that swim in the water, and that's how they spread, you know, Mm. and they're spread by water droplets bouncing from one leaf to another or one plant to another. So the fungal pathogens and bacterial pathogens are going to see you and your mist are coming, and they're going to say, thank you, ma'am. You just made it easier for me to culture myself on the surface of this leaf for long enough to either find my way in through an open stoma, right, the stomata, or if I'm a fungal disease, grow appendages that then pierce the tissue of your plant and I now reproduce inside of it. Black spot on roses, I think eight hours, I think is about all it takes for that fungal disease to proliferate and be able to inoculate itself into plant tissue. So yeah, watering on the foliage, you are creating an environment that is conducive for pathogens and doesn't really help your plant for the most part. Yeah. So be advised, plant friends. Now let's go back. I'd love to kind of hit a couple of really common houseplant diseases that people get and struggle with. And maybe you can just tell us a little bit about them. You kind of already talked about symptoms, but just kind of a reiteration of what it looks like and then how to treat it. So why don't we start with powdery mildew? Because I feel like that's a big one for people. Yeah, powdery mildew is pretty pervasive on a lot of different plant species, both indoors and out. You know, outside when it's cool and humid, you can have powdery mildew blow up on your, you know, outdoor plants and indoor plants as well. And it's that fuzzy white growth that is on the surface of leaves and it grows very quickly and it essentially blocks photosynthesis. So any of these fungal diseases that reproduce and proliferate on the surface of your leaf are causing another problem. Not only are they siphoning off resources, but they're blocking that leaf from really being able to photosynthesize. So generally, powdery mildew, it's not always terminal for every plant. Some plants can tolerate it better and grow out of it. Some plants have a much harder time with it, but it reduces overall growth, obviously, because it's blocking photosynthesis and and siphoning off resources. You're usually going to see sort of stunted yellowing leaves that drop and that white fuzzy, right, mildew on the leaf surface. So overhead irrigation or overhead misting, high humidity, all of those things are going to make powdery mildew really happy. And how do you treat it? Can you just wipe it off? So prevention is great. If you know the conditions outdoor and that are going to make powdery mildew happy, there are preventative or as I like to say, prophylactic treatments called plant washes that you can put on before your plants start to show infection. And that can really help keep those fungal diseases, not just powdery mildew, from setting in, right? From rooting in, so to speak. So during times of high humidity, right? Using a plant wash or a prophylactic spray can be helpful. Foliar fungicides, like the Bordeaux mixture that I mentioned last time, you guys can look up the recipe for that online if you want to DIY. It's basically a copper fungicide. So copper fungicides are commonly used for things like powdery mildew. Typically, drying out, dialing back on the water and humidity coming down and keeping water off the foliage, removing all of the infected foliage, oftentimes you can get that plant back on track. Now, understand that you may have, if any leaves have dropped or spores have gotten other places, you could have a persistent reinfection problem. So that's something to be aware of. 
Dr. Laurie Santos, host of the Happiness Lab podcast. Making new friends and maintaining old friendships is a great way to boost your happiness. There are lots of sources of well-being standing around you. You just have to tap into them. But sadly, we don't always feel up for being sociable. If I was approaching a stranger, my heart would race. I'd feel like I was going to throw up. I just had so much anxiety around it. So in a new season of the show, I'll tackle how to make firm friendships firmer, right through to the joy you can find in talking to total strangers. I'm very much enjoying your animal print scarf, madam. You look wonderful. The steps to becoming more social might surprise you. But trust me, they're things you can introduce into your daily routine right away. I adore your purple hair, madam. It pops. So listen to The Happiness Lab on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your shows. Plant friends, I just returned from the most amazing vacation in Italy, and particularly what made it so amazing is the work that I did before I left to refresh my Italian with Rosetta Stone. I've been prepping for this trip to Italy for the last several months with daily doses of Rosetta Stone on their easy-to-use platform and app. It makes learning a language or refreshing a language so easy, and I had so much fun while doing it. It was a great way to wake my brain up in the morning. If you have international travel coming up, I gotta tell you, knowing the basics of the local language helps so much much. When we were in Italy, we were able to avoid the tourist traps and we were able to really plug into the culture, right? That's why you travel internationally. If you've had learning a language on your bucket list, Rosetta Stone has been the expert in language learning for 30 years. They've helped millions of people build the fluency and confidence to speak new languages through immersion. It even has this cool speech recognition feature, which actually tracks how you're pronouncing the language and gives you feedback on how to pronounce it with a more authentic accent. Whether you want to refresh a language skill you learned a while ago, like I did. Maybe you want to learn a new language to get the most out of your travel. Rosetta Stone can help get you there. They have 25 languages to choose from and a lifetime membership. So I learned Italian this year, but because I have the lifetime membership, I can learn Spanish or Chinese next year or in 10 years. And they're giving you an insane discount. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a limited time, Growing Joy listeners get 50% off Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Plan friend, it's a (laughs) no-brainer. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com slash today. That's rosetta, R-O-S-E-T-T-A, stone.com slash today. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. And then what's the difference, because a quick Google, what's the difference between powdery mildew and then the white gray mold? Well, okay, so there's white mold and gray mold, and those are two different species. So let's talk about gray mold because that's very common on indoor plants, especially 
flowering plants like gesneriads. Gray mold is botrytis, which you may have heard okay. botrytis. Yes. So this is a mold yeah. disease that also grows on the leaf surface that can also get on flowers, outdoor and indoor. And yeah, it causes a lot of damage to flowers, a lot of aesthetic damage. Plants like African violets, you know, are, are susceptible. Like I said, gesneriads, roses, tomatoes, all sorts of things. You're going to see kind of white spots that turn gray on the stems and then they turn brown and then they kind of spread to flowers. And you might even start to see some webbing with that. Removing the infected leaves and flowers, improving your air circulation, and then again, a foliar fungicide that's labeled for botrytis or gray mold would be what you want to use. Okay. And then what about, so the white mold is different. So what do I need to know about that? Yeah, there's the white mold um, is a very white, fuzzy mass that can infect your leaves and flowers and fruit. And you'll see more of a water-soaked spot on the flowers and, and leaves. And then white, fuzzy masses will follow. You get leaf yellowing, they wilt, they die. It does a lot of damage to fruit. So kind of more of an issue on some of your fruiting plants and vegetable plants, often outdoors. What about like, I've had people write in where I think it's because they've overwatered and the soil gets covered in mold. Yeah. So, well, now remember that there are beneficial fungi that will break down organic matter in the soil. So a lot of times, you know, when you see um, white kind of masses in the soil or compost or garden soil, a lot of times that's just the mycelial filaments of fungi that are just, they're not attacking your plant. They're just breaking down organic matter in the media. But you have to look closely and make sure that what you're not seeing are root mealybugs, which can also look white and fuzzy <laughs> on your roots in the potting soil, right? So you have to look a little bit more closely to make sure. Now, if you are keeping plants really wet and you're doing things like dumping coffee grounds and or banana peels or any of that stuff in your plant pots, yes, you are going to grow a mold mildew farm. Not that all those species are going to directly attack your plant tissue, but they could create conditions that are conducive for root rot diseases. So if you are dumping a bunch of undecomposed organic matter into your houseplant pots, which I do not recommend that you do, specifically for this reason, it can cause all sorts of problems, then yes, you could be getting molds growing because they're breaking down that organic matter. Okay, got it. One more mold that you might see is sooty molds. Yes, sooty mold. Yeah, and you'll get that on a lot of citrus or, you know, things like that. Any plants that are susceptible to, you know, aphids or scale or white flies, sooty mold is like a secondary infection that grows on that honeydew. And that's a black mold that will cover the leaf. You want to wipe that off and use the fun side. So at least with the sooty mold, it's relatively easy to wipe off because it's growing on the honeydew, right? That's what it's feeding on. It's just blocking light to your leaves. So that's another common one that you'll see. Okay, got it. All right. So that's the mildews and the molds. What about leaf spot? Of which there are only 5 million different. Million. <laughs> <laughs> and also I feel like leaf spot, you can have a brown spot from too much light, which we've talked about before. And then you can also have fungal leaf spot or a bacterial leaf spot. So What's the general things we need to know about leaf spot and how to treat it? Well, there are many different leaf spots or leaf blights. Well, we often call them leaf blights. Clearly not enough time for me to go through them all in detail today. But so some common ones that you're going to deal with are caused by fungal um, species like Phytophthora or Altenaria, Fusarium, all sorts of different species that cause leaf spots. They all have different patterns. They can vary from dark gray to green water-soaked spots that will grow large and then turn brown. You could have small brown spots that turn the entire leaf yellow and curl and drop. I mean, there's just so many different leaf spots, but generally we call them leaf spots because that's how they start to present, is by like mm -hmm. little dots that start to show up on the plant that start to get bigger and then start to cause discoloration around the spots. And then you may start to get necrosis. You know, that tissue dies out where the spot was, and then it can begin to spread. Now, some leaf spot diseases 
will spread and become systemic, like black rot, for example, can start out as spots on the leaves, Phytophthora, again, another common culprit, Pythium, and those spots be, get bigger and bigger, and then they start to move into the stem tissue, and then they can start getting down into the root tissue, right? So some leaf spot diseases, you know, you can keep a little bit more confined and treat, but you have to keep an eye on lesions that start to converge and get bigger and then start to spread, right? Which could be bacterial, but also a lot of fungal diseases operate that way. So there are many different species. So generally, again, you're going to be looking to remove any infected leaves immediately, okay? If you suspect any sort of fungal spot disease, right? check your watering, check your humidity, and apply a foliar fungicide, which you're usually going to need to do at about 10-day intervals. You know, some will on the label tell you to do it every seven days. Some will say two weeks. I also recommend alternating your fungicides because there is a lot of fungicide resistance. I'm not going to give you specific brands or specific types in this episode because, again, we're generally talking about a million different leaf spot diseases, different products will be labeled for different diseases. So you need to kind of get a basic idea of what you're dealing with and then look for a treatment that's labeled for that disease. We're talking about this houseplant first aid kit that through these conversations we're having, the items keep coming up. And I do feel like fungicide, it's really good to have because it could address leaf spot. It could address mold. Obviously, you need to know what you're dealing with, but there's a lot of fungal issues with plants. And I would have never thought to have fungicide in my houseplant shelves that I have. So that is interesting. Yeah. And the plant washes, right, that are prophylactic, we'll call them condoms for plants. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Plant washes, you know, they sort of can prevent, again, those fungal diseases from, you know, inoculating the plant as well. But then having, you know, fungicides, and there are more new bio pesticides on the market that address pests and and many of the fungal diseases that are out there too. So that's worth looking into as well is the new groups of biopesticides for fungus control as well. So really, you know, anytime that you see any spots happening, we need to look at, okay, is it spider mites? Check the underside. Is it white flies? Like look for a sign of a pest first, because you're probably going to be able to see that much easier and much more quickly. You know, that modeled appearance could be spider mites. It might not be a disease. So turn that leaf under, check the leaf axis, look for mealybugs, look for white flies. If you do not find any sign of an insect or mite, okay, then you're probably dealing with a pathogen and, you know, kind of using those general guidelines to discern between a bacterial and a fungal spot disease. If you aren't sure, kind of which one you're dealing with, then look for fungicide labeled for the type of plant you're treating. That's the next step to be very general, right? So if you are growing orchids, look for a fungicide that's labeled for orchids because chances are that fungicide is going to deal with the major fungal diseases that attack orchids. Does that make sense? Got it. On the topic of fungal, anything, any other fungal issues we should be thinking of that's beyond the leaf spot? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, Root rot. I mean, obviously we know that... Yes, let's talk about root rot because I feel like some people don't think it's a disease, you know, but it really is. So it's multiple diseases, right? So root rot and damping off are very general terms that we use to describe the impact of multiple species of fungi. Okay, Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Fusarium, Phytophthora. These are all culprits that contribute, kind of work together to damage, right, root tissue. So they will, when we're talking about damping off, say you're growing something from seed, all of those pathogens come together and basically attack that seedling at the soil line or right below it, right, and get into the roots and then just they turn to mush. For larger plants, again, If you're growing media, say, is staying wet, you don't have good drainage, the pathogen is present or you come in contact with it, then yes, plants will begin to kind of droop and wilt or turn brown and collapse. When you inspect the root tissue, it can look kind of brown or slimy. So root rot issues that are a result of a bunch of different species of fungi can be a very common pressure problem 
in hen house plants or anything that you're growing inside for sure. And in those situations, what you're actually going to do is potentially a combination of something like a fungicide soil drench, right? You have to treat the root zone. And oftentimes it's probably going to involve repotting, taking that plant out, cutting away damaged root tissue, using a clean growing media and treating again with a soil drench, right? Yeah, because root rot, I feel like is hard to come back from too, because if the roots of your plants are gone, you know, like if they've turned to brown and mush, your plant needs roots. So also I feel like root rot is another one where you might want to consider just taking propagations of the leaves of the plant before it starts to really deteriorate and starting again, right? Yeah, I mean, you're always taking the risk when you propagate an inoculated plant that you are simply propagating another infected specimen. Mm -hmm. So I'm usually going to tell you, unless the top of that plant looks super clean, you can't find... Now, viruses, no. If you have a virus plant, you don't take any cuttings off of that plant, period, because that's a systemic situation. Now, any of these other diseases that spread through the vascular system are also systemic and but they you know you can see their path of travel like from the leaf down into the stem you see those lesions developing as they move right <laughs> down into your root system so sometimes you can cut them off at the pass and we'll talk about that in a minute but i don't typically recommend taking cuttings now let's say for example you have an african violet African violets have very small, delicate root systems and they can rot very quickly. So let's mm-hmm. say that happens to you. African violets, you know, are pretty totipotent. All the parts of that plant can regenerate all the tissue that that plant needs to grow a new blooming, blooming specimen, right? So if you have a top crown of an African violet that's lost all its roots to root rot, but all the top looks super clean and healthy, Yeah, chances are like you're good to go. You can prop that or even just take that crown that's recalloused and repot it up and grow a new root system on it. Mm -hmm. Other plants aren't going to do that. So in addition to understanding what disease you're dealing with and understanding the environmental conditions that were conducive, it's species specific. Some species are tolerant of certain pathogens more so than others. And just due to their anatomy and morphology and totipotency of different cells, they may be able to come back from that just by callousing and growing new adventitious roots, whereas other plants are just not capable of doing that. So for example, your African violet versus say you have a citrus seedling and that citrus plant loses its root system, it's probably more likely that you'll be able to regenerate that African violet than you will your citrus seedling because you can't take petiole leaf cuttings of your citrus. That's not going to be viable, but you can of your African violet. So it comes down to also knowing a little bit about the plant species that you're growing and what its tolerance is for different diseases. And can you, is it a species that you can take out and let dry out of the pot for a while before you try to repot it? Some species will tolerate that. Some species will just dry up and die. (laughs) <laughs> just depends, Maria. It just yeah. depends. It just depends. Leslie's favorite catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs> it just depends. I know that we had kind of talked about viruses already. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about with viruses and then also the treatment? With viruses, there really isn't any treatment. You need to destroy that plant if you suspect that you have a virus. Now, I will say, right, if you're not sitting in a lab at home and, and you really are not sure how to diagnose the problem that you have, and you really want a specific answer, what I would say is that you likely have a land-grant university in your state that has an extension service, and that extension service is available to home growers to send in plant samples for disease diagnosis. It's a great resource. So look up your local extension agency and look up their lab diagnostic services you can have your soil tested, right, right, for your garden, and you can send in plant samples. You'll need to follow a very specific list of instructions they'll give you about how to bag that sample up and where to send it. You'll pay a small fee, which supports the extension service to do these sorts of things, and you can get a lab diagnosis to see if you have a virus or disease. So that's very important. And if you're anybody out there who has decided to sort of like have a hobby growing business and you're selling plants and you're propagating, 
you better have a pretty good handle on all this and make sure you know what you're doing so that you're not sending people inoculated plants. Yeah, definitely. Well, this was actually, this brought up a, a listener question. Otis, a beloved member of our community. Otis. Hi, Otis. Shout out, Otis. Love you. He wants to know, without the proper testing, most things are a best guess when it comes to figuring out if your plant has a certain disease. What is a go-to resource in terms of diagnosing the disease? I think mentioning the extension is something that a lot of people don't know that they can reach out to. You know, I want to give a shout out to your book, Gardening Under Lights is also a good one. But where, Leslie, would you suggest people going to try and figure this out when there's so much misinformation in blogs? Well, there is no one place to go to in terms of diagnosing disease. What I would suggest you do, obviously, look for books that are specific to this topic. There are a number of good books out there. Like I've got a reference table in the middle of Gardening Under Plants that you can look at, but there's lots of good books written by qualified people. Usually, they will be by category. So there may be perennial diseases, vegetable plant diseases, orchid diseases, right? So look for books that are specific to what you're growing. And typically, they're going to highlight what specific diseases are a particular issue. And then I would go online and look up university research specifically. Oftentimes, that's where you're going to find pictures of diseases on plants. It's going to be through university research. Unfortunately, most of the plant and houseplant blogs that I see online that address diseases and treatments don't always get the information correct. And so certainly peruse those, but what you want to do is back that up by looking at some actual research information. So university publications that are put out through extension services as well are a great resource for that next to specific books that you pull on plant diseases, garden plant diseases, right? So go to the books, go to the university information specifically. And then if you want an actual diagnosis, take advantage of your local extension service. Listen, I built my plant care education online, right? I mean, I was on all the blogs, all the Googles, all the whatever. I understand people have to Google their way to figuring this out. Sure, But there is something I think to having a library, a shelf on my bookshelf filled with current and antique books. When you go to the bookshop, there are so many great gardening books that are a dollar, three dollars, you know, and the really nerdy ones tend to be even more yeah. discounted because people don't want to buy them. So having Leslie's book, having Hesseon's book, everybody loves that book. I mean, I've got like 20 books on my bookshelf now at this point because of my insane vintage book, uh, gardening book habit. But it's kind of amazing because, yeah, now I might Google stuff and I might click around and see what I can find. But then I can go actually pull a book off yeah. the bookshelf or go to the disease section of the book. I can cross-reference a couple of books to see what those photos are. But if someone's publishing a book, there's vetting and fact-checking that is not happening on blogs. And so I really do feel like now that I like am taking this a little bit more seriously, I'm just really enjoying my book collection as like a reference system. Yeah, I have a huge plant library, obviously. <laughs> and if you want, if you want what I can do, if you'll remind me, I will put together a short list of some good books specific to this topic that your listeners can reference if you'd like. That would be amazing. And also, that's also reminding me, we have a living library in my community, in the community platform, which is books that we've recommended, books that community members have recommended. So we can also add that list to that living library as well. But that list of books would be amazing to put in the show notes here. If you're Googling something, add the word research or publication to your search phrase. And that is going to bring up actual research. There are 5 million blogs out there that tell you to put cinnamon on all of these fungal diseases. Mm -hmm. I hate to break it to you, but taking cinnamon powder and putting it on all of these fungal diseases is not a researched viable solution necessarily. You know, cinnamon, there is an extract, okay, in cinnamon called cinnamaldehyde that has potentially been shown to have some suppressive action for fungal issues, but those tests have only been done in the lab, in culture, not in plant culture, right? So most of the information on cinnamon is very anecdotal. 
there really isn't any research that backs up that particular application. And understand there's a bunch of different species of cinnamon. And I believe the extracts that have been tested have only come from what we call, quote unquote, real cinnamon, which is, um, I think, Simonium burnum. And so everybody else is using something called cinnamon, which could be 10 different species of plants, some not even in the genus that the rest of the cinnamon plants are in. So I'm going to tell you not to dump cinnamon on your plants because it's not a proven fungicide. It's got potential. And the extracts, right, the essential oil extracts that contain cinnamaldehyde can potentially suppress certain fungal activities and potentially bacterial activities, but that still has not been proven in a controlled study with growing plants. So I'm still going to tell you to use a fungicide that's labeled for that disease in that plant. Bordeaux mixture is a particular fungicide that I feel is you can make that DIY, but that's got copper and copper is a research study proven fungicide. So there's lots of anecdotal quote unquote cures online in blog after blog after blog. But from my perspective, you're wasting really good expensive cinnamon on your plants. I would again, put that on your French toast before you dump it all over your plants. You know, especially if you've got a bacterial or fungal disease that's moving and you've got this. Yeah, because you're also wasting time. You know, you've got this orchid or you've got this expensive anthurium and you just dump a bunch of cinnamon on there thinking that's going to cure it. It's, I hate to tell you, but that's not going to save that plant most likely. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to be smart about what you're using. Natural is good. Prevention is best. Sometimes you have to resort to something that's a little more powerful. Yeah. Speaking of orchids, we had one more listener question. What would be the best course of action for treating black rot on a Dracula or any orchid? This is such a thorn in the side of every orchid grower. Black I rot know. yeah, is a very pervasive, it's caused by a couple of different fungal species, Phytophthora and Pythium specifically. And black rot affects a bunch of different orchids. Cataleas are particularly susceptible. And, you know, it can start as those little dark brown to black spots on the leaves, and then it gets bigger and bigger and starts to consume the whole leaf. And then it starts to move into the stems, and then it can move into the pseudobulbs. But it can also start on stem tissue as well. And again, leaving water on the foliage, sitting on the foliage of your orchids is a no-no. And if you do it, you should wipe them down immediately to prevent this problem. So let's say you've got some black rot that you can see starting on your orchid leaves, Dracula or other species. The first thing you want to do is sort of check the adjacent stem. Make sure you don't see any of those dark lesions there. And if you don't, take a, a knife and cut away those leaves, right? If you see that rot moving down the stem, cut below the infected part of the stem, cut that off. You may have to actually cut part of your pseudobulb away, or you may have to go all the way down to the rhizome and cut it out until you get to uninfected tissue. And then you need to follow up with the fungicide. Speaking as a commercial grower, there are fungicides like Fizan, Captan, Truban, Terazol, Allia, Dithane, a whole bunch that are labeled specifically for black rot. Some are going to be available to homeowners and some are not. So you have to look, you know, fungicide, black rot, and see what products come up available to you. So if the pseudobulbs or the rhizomes are clearly infected, probably going to be time to just go ahead and cull the herd and sacrifice the weak to keep that from spreading to your other plants. Or you can try one of the systemic fungicides to see if you can knock it out. But yeah, physical removal before it moves is best and then follow up with a treatment a fungicide treatment, um, usually every couple of weeks, rotating your brands. Got it. Okay. This was so much information. My head is spinning. <laughs> it's just scratching the surface as usual. I know. Any final thoughts on pest disease? I mean, I think the research-based, like figuring out the research, doing it right the first time instead of kind of like flailing also makes sense when time is of the essence I think, you know, I feel like at the end of every episode, I ask you this question, but also I think we need to give people a gentle reminder that sometimes if you have a virus, if you have a root rot that's too far gone, sometimes it's okay to just call it and, you know, be okay with letting that plant go and trying again. Anything else that you want to say to wrap up? Pay attention. 
pay attention to your plants because again, prevention is the, is the best cure, right? Is preventing and managing your environment. And, you know, when you see something that doesn't look right on your plant, fully investigating it, but yeah, don't think that you have committed some sort of personal failure because your plant is inoculated with a fungal disease or a bacterial disease. I mean, nature always wins people and plant diseases. We get the flu, our plants get the flu. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, even expert, I mean, no experts, plants are immune from disease, okay? Especially commercial growers. When you are growing plants in a greenhouse or you're growing them for production, like if you're growing inside in a grow tent, you've created this perfect incubator for diseases and pests. So of course they're gonna be a problem. No one is immune from having to deal with this. And the last thing you wanna do is spread a disease to the rest of your plants simply by thinking hanging on to it is the right thing to do. Now, understand that certain viruses, the recommendation is that you have to bag it and trash it. Putting it in the compost in a home compost situation is not going to kill a plant virus. And through insect vectors, you could end up spreading that disease. So if you suspect a virus, then you want to make sure to follow proper instructions for disposing of that plant. And your local extension agency is going to be really helpful to give you the right information there. Love it. Love it. And love you, Leslie. Where can everyone find you to go nerd out with you on the social (laughs) medias and websites? As always, you can find me at LeslieHallock.com, Instagram at Leslie Hallock. You can find my plant parenting group on Facebook through Hallock Horticultural. And yeah, through all of your lovely podcast episodes we've done together over the years. Yes, love it. All right, on to the next. Until next time. Grow better. Grow better, baby. Thank you. Thank you to Leslie Halleck. She has graciously agreed to like keep coming on the show for this Grow Better series. So let me know what else you want me to interview Leslie about. It's so fun talking to her. And all of her books are linked in the show notes. If you're interested in her book on grow lights, in her book on tiny plants, in her book on plant propagation, she's got a book for everything. She's so amazing. We're going to put the links to all the stuff we talked about in the show notes as well. And we're putting together a episode on a plant first aid kit for you. So get excited. I'm so stoked about that episode. I hope this episode helped you. Plants get diseases just like people get diseases, right? Plants get sick like we get sick. So you didn't do anything wrong and you're doing everything right by listening to this episode today to empower yourself to know how to treat it next time this problem comes around. So I hope this was helpful. Let me know in the Growing Joy Garden Society or on social media at Growing Joy with Maria. And you go to jointhegardensociety.com if you want to join the Garden Society. And uh, until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. 
you can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm -hmm. 